In my view, there is one character who doesn't fit neatly into the themes of Lord of the Flies, and that is Simon. In today's video, we'll take a look at what the author himself said about this enigmatic character. We first meet Simon in Chapter 1 when he arrives with Jack and the choir. Then one of the boys flopped on his face in the sand. They heaved the fallen boy to the platform and let him lie. Jack explains that the boy is always throwing a feint, and the story moves on. Only 12 pages later does this boy sit up, smile pallidly, and introduce himself as Simon. There's been speculation that Simon has epilepsy, but like much about this character, it's never clearly explained. Golding's description of Simon's appearance sets the boy apart from the other characters. Now that the pallor of his faint was over, he was a skinny, vivid little boy with a glance coming up from under a hut of straight hair that hung down, black and coarse. Let's consider this description and compare it with the words and phrases used to describe some of the other key characters at the start of the text. So Simon is skinny, vivid little boy, straight hair, black and coarse. Ralph, fair, golden boy, might make a boxer as far as width and heaviness of shoulders went. There was a stillness about Ralph as he sat that marked him out. There was his size and attractive appearance. Jack, tall, thin and bony, hair was red, face was crumpled and freckled, light blue eyes. Piggy, greasy, plump, scratched, fat, grubby, pale. Clearly, Simon is set apart from the other characters. Jack and Ralph have physical height and broad shoulders, and Piggy is fat, but Simon is both skinny and short. We see this when he explores the island with Jack, Ralph and Piggy in Chapter 1. If Simon walks in the middle of us, said Ralph, then we could talk over his head. The three of them fall into step. That This meant that every now and then Simon had to do a double shuffle to catch up with the others. Here we can picture Simon as being so short that not only can Jack and Ralph talk over his head, but he has to almost run to keep up with their walking. So Golding's physical description of the character sets Simon apart from the others, but the question is why? It seems quite obvious that Ralph and Jack represent different types of leadership, democratic Ralph and totalitarian Jack. We looked at that in the video on leadership. It's also quite plain to see that Piggy represents a rational, scientific approach to the world, but what exactly does Simon represent? Golding himself explained that Simon is a Christ figure in a 1962 UCLA lecture. However, when you read the novel, you might, like me, come away thinking, how exactly is Simon a Christ figure, and what is the point of him being so? Let's begin by looking at some of the ways in which Simon can be interpreted as a Christ-like character. Number one, he prophesies the future. Simon seems to be able to tell what's going to happen in the future when he tells Ralph, you'll get back to where you came from in chapter 7. It's interesting that he tells Ralph you rather than saying we'll get back to where we came from. It's as if Simon not only knows that Ralph will get off the island, but that he himself will not. And both statements are correct, although the first time reader doesn't know it at the time. This parallels Jesus in the Bible prophesying his own death. Number two, he goes off alone into the wilderness of the jungle and is tempted by the Lord of the Flies. Now, this one takes a bit of explaining. In the Bible, Jesus often went off by himself to pray. In Lord of the Flies, Simon goes off by himself numerous times. And although it's not explicitly stated in the text that those wanderings have anything to do with prayer, in the same 1962 UCLA lecture, Golding explained... For reasons it is not necessary to specify, I included a Christ figure in my fable. This is the little boy Simon, solitary, stammering, a lover of mankind, a visionary, who reaches common sense attitudes not by reason but by intuition. Of all the boys, he is the only one who feels the need to be alone and goes every now and then into the bushes. Go he does and prays, as the child Jean Vianney would go, and some other saints, though not many. He is really turning a part of the jungle into a church, not a physical one perhaps, but a spiritual one. So there we have it from the author himself. At this point, it's worth looking at these parts of the text, the first of which is in chapter 3. Take a look at it in your own copy of the book, starting at Simon turned away from them and went where the just perceptible path led him. Soon high jungle closed in. And later in chapter 8, starting at Simon had passed through the area of fruit trees. So pause the video whilst you read those two sections. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't get any real sense of church or prayer. 
Maybe the kneeling down is a reference to Luke 22.41. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. If we believe Simon is praying, we have to take Golding's word for it, rather than finding it in the text itself, which isn't ideal. However, while the idea of Simon praying might be open to scrutiny, probably the most clear allusion to Jesus is found when Simon speaks to the Lord of the Flies in the jungle. In the Bible in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus goes into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights where he is tempted by the devil. In a similar way, the Lord of the Flies tempts Simon, saying to him, There isn't anyone to help you, only me, and I'm the beast. Simon's mouth laboured, brought forth audible words, pig's head on a stick. Fancy thinking the beast was something you could hunt and kill, said the head. For a moment or two, the forest and all the other dimly appreciated places echoed with the parody of laughter. You knew, didn't you? I am part of you. Close, close, close. I'm the reason why it's no go. Why things are what they are. The laughter shivered again. Come now, said the Lord of the Flies. Get back to the others and we'll forget the whole thing. This is one of the clearer references to Jesus and another comes in the death of Simon. The way Simon tries to tell the boys the truth about the beast and is murdered reminds us of Christ's teaching followed by his crucifixion. David Anderson, in his 1969 book The Tragic Protest, writes, Armed now with saving knowledge, Simon hastens back to tell the others, only to be set upon by the hunters and torn to pieces as he is attempting to deliver his message. We are reminded of a redeemer who conquered demons and offered men knowledge of salvation, only to be scourged and nailed to a cross by the people he had come to save. The truth about man is not merely that he is savage and afraid, but that he refuses deliverance and murders the messengers of light. The murder of Simon at the hands of those he's trying to enlighten is perhaps the strongest parallel between his character and Christ, but there are also plenty of ambiguous moments that don't make sense if the character is supposed to remind us of Jesus. He faints regularly, he struggles to speak in front of the group, the quote, Simon became inarticulate in his effort to express mankind's essential illness. The teaching of Jesus, on the other hand, is eloquent and articulate, the complete opposite of Simon. In Golding's biography by John Carey, we discover that Charles Monteith, Golding's editor at the publisher's Faber, felt there were two major weaknesses within the text. The second major flaw was Simon, who was very evidently a Christ figure. Monteith said Simon must be made ambivalent, eliminated or toned down in such a way as to make Simon explicable in purely rational terms. We learn in the same biography that some of the bits cut from the original manuscript included Simon being told it was wrong to eat the fruit on the island, which reminds us of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. So this is helpful. Simon is essentially cut back in the book that we study, and therefore he doesn't make as much sense as a character or a Christ figure. Golding went on to say he resented Monteith's cutting of the Simon character. So it is possible to see some references to Christ in the character of Simon, although they're not as clear as they once were in the novel's first draft. But why did Golding include a Christ figure at all? As seen in the quotation at the start of the text, we don't have the answer from Golding himself to this one. For reasons it is not necessary to specify, he explained. Perhaps the most obvious answer is that it shows us the true extent of evil in the boys on the island, that they take this innocent, good, truth-bearing person and kill him for no reason. Simon is no threat to anyone. He isn't challenging for leadership of the group. He isn't in direct conflict with any of the other boys, but still he is killed. We might be able to understand Jack and Ralph's conflict with each other as each vies for the position of leader on the island, but there's no sense behind conflict with Simon, and his death serves as the most obvious example of the innate evil in humanity, which after all was Golding's main theme. As the author put it in the UCLA lecture, man produces evil as a bee produces honey. Not only did the boys ruin the Eden-like paradise of the island, they kill the Christ-like Simon.